Okay. So, just gonna go with it. Uh, first video. I want to start to do a video about books and stuff, namely the books I'm reading. Uh, don't want to just do a summary because the book is way too long for that, over 400 some odd pages, just over. So um, instead I'm going to do it close to 100 pages at a time. Right now I've got notes on the first 100 pages, uh, as you can tell, I've taken more of the second 100 than the first 100. Um, anyway, there's still some great ideas, great concepts I want to I want to go over and I want to talk about. But first things first, this is the book. It is, uh, can you see that? Yeah. Point Counterpoint by Aldous Huxley. This is the, oh, what version is this? Um, this will be edited. This is Let's see here. 1996 printing. Um, nothing's changed though. First Dalkey, Dalkey, Archive Edition, 1996. Um, the introduction is by Nicholas Mosley, but I did not read it because I started to, and it gave away spoilers. So, and this video will too give away very heavy spoilers. But anyway, going right into it. First, uh, first, four, first, one hundred pages. So part one, point counterpoint. Um, one thing. Uh, okay, so first the setting. We'll start out with the setting. Um, the first hundred pages basically all take place in one night at a party thrown by Lady uh, Tantamount. Lady Edward, as she's known, because she's married to Lady Edward, or she's married to Edward Tantamount, who inherited his riches and his uh, mansion, which is where the party is taking place. Okay, so she has invited all these different types of people. Now, what, what, these, uh, what Huxley has done with all these different types of people is that he has um, given them or based them off a real-life intellectual person that he either knew about in his day or knew personally on a personal level and um, or was before his time. Now, I did not look up to see necessarily uh, who's who specifically because I didn't want to know before going into this because I, I looked at some of the names that were supposed to be represented in this book, but I um, I don't know who's who. Um, but I want to go back after I finish the book and look at it because this is the first read. This isn't me talking about the love of a book that I have that I've already read in the past and that now I'm trying to share. It is... Um, solely just this is the first rendition first read through uh for me this is the first video too so it's gonna be pretty garbage but it'll be fun let's try it out okay one of the first things that stands out to me in that um in what huxley uses as his uh, plot device and as a way to describe these um characters is that the way that they're married their marriages that they share and how most of them are very unhappy in one way or another and very few of them actually only one of them that i can see of actually has um anybody being happy um the first one that we're introduced is to uh, marjorie and walter it's the very first uh marriage very first introduction of characters and actually it's introduced and it introduces a very kind of like already on a down note on a, like a sour note and that it was, uh, says, uh, you won't be late, Marjorie's telling Walter. Um, Walter said, no, I won't be late, unhappily and guiltily certain that he would be. Her voice annoyed him. It drawled a little. It was too refined, even in misery. So there right there, we already have a, um, a good idea of what Huxley's trying to portray in this first marriage and that it's miserable. Oh, both people are so unhappy. Both people are absolutely just god-awful. They're just not happy in it. And we later come to find out that Walter is actually trying, at least, to have an affair with Tantamount, the lady I, I said before, the one who uh, is throwing the party. Um, her daughter, Lucy, is actually the one that Walter is trying to be with. Um, and multiple times so far in this first part, he she rejects him over and over and over again. He's always trying to get her alone. He's always very passive about it, though. He's very weak. He's very weak with Marjorie. And he's very weak with Lucy. Both. I don't. Um, I don't see yet 
anything that he would like about Lucy more than Marjorie because as far as I can tell the only difference between the two is that Lucy has money and Marjorie doesn't. Lucy's character hasn't been fleshed out um, hugely yet. I mean that, that'll, that'll come around the second part more. I've already read part of the second part. Um, anyway so that she's trying to leave Marjorie to go meet her up meet up with her um, and then the way that he's trying to have an affair with her is very very close to how his dad John Bidlake um, is very close to Lady Tantamount now it says they had an affair I don't know if it was necessarily a sexual one I don't know it doesn't it does it actually doesn't really say um it hints towards maybe there was but that it really didn't amount to anything they didn't get anything out of that section of it anyway they just they focused mainly on um just talking which, which is what they continue to do at these parties and at these get-togethers and everything now john bidlake is an artist and he used to be a very brilliant artist. He used to be you know, just absolutely magnificent. Everybody talks about how how amazing, how well he captured the light and everything. Um, look at me trying to use art terms. I don't know. He's supposed to be brilliant. He's supposed to be able to portray people very well. However, he is known to not be a very religious man. And that um, isn't shown to actually take anything away from his art. Except for that people think it does. And maybe people think it does because it's supposed to in their mind. Because um, since he is not divinely inspired, then how can he have any kind of true understanding as to how to portray these people in a real way or a spiritual way? And it's it's he's not ever going for that. Um, he's only ever showing what he wants. He's only ever showing what he. Uh... How am I trying to say this? Cut this part. He's only ever trying to show. Um, what he sees much in the way that Huxley is doing with this I think I think um, and so he's he talks with Lady Edward they kind of mock and make fun of the guests that she invites because they're all outlandish rich people who have never worked a day in their life and that's that's another common thing that will be brought up later on as well but skipping ahead to um, another scene later on with uh, John Bidwick's daughter and his daughter's marriage with uh, a man named Philip. What's so fascinating about the relationship between Eleanor and Philip is that Philip is an intellectual. They are both down in India sharing time together while he's working on a book about India and about the people there. Um, what makes him so special is he's so intellectually brilliant. He can draw connections between things that are just way out there and beyond what anybody else can comprehend. And he can put it to paper, and he can describe it well. He can do it so clearly. He can he can make things so basic and easy to understand when explained. Or he can show a connection that people are like, well, I guess this just happens. No, he shows the reason for why it happens. He shows the consequences for it happening. However, he's missing so crucially that human element of um, relationship, a feeling of the uh, of why people would say instead of. This is why this happens, and this is what results of it. He doesn't get the whole, well, I guess it just happens. He has to know. He has to know. But he loses out on so much of the human emotion, and Eleanor, in that, thinks that he loses so much of his writing because of it. And so what she does, even, is she tries to set him up, even with dates. He's, he, she tries to set him up to have affairs, because then maybe he would fall in love with one of those. Uh, one of those women that she sets him up with and it's like uh, you're you're reading that and it's like why why would she ever do this the the reason is spelled out because she thinks that it'll be better for his art and it's like are you that devoted to him or are you that devoted to his art and it's and at that point you also have to ask the question is there a difference between the two is there a difference between being devoted between the two and it's just so it's like it, it, it rings so true for someone who is like, uh, who, who's, who's so professional, who's so 
um, about career goal oriented go 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 and misses out on the human element but then you know they find someone they fall in love and everything and that's such a you know such a basic premise of like every single romantic comedy ever almost and it's like you finally you, you see that and this is in a book that was written in 1920 something I mean it's okay was this one of the first ones to do it probably not but still very early on and showing that it's very intriguing it's very intriguing um huxley's take on it as in this is something um people being together for the wrong reasons or the right reasons you know or the justification of them being together and what they do for each other has been absurd ever since you know for at least a hundred years if not more you know definitely more but we can see from the book at least a hundred years and it's you you just you Aww. you see the support that Eleanor gives to Philip and then right after that chapter you you um, it's flipped over to another couple called um, named Mary and Mark Rampion now Rampion is a playwright and Rampion is also a writer kind of ish not not necessarily a, a novelistic kind of writer more of a more just a, does the playwrights and poetry and you know but still philosophy he's a thinker obviously he grew up poor he grew up poor and he's married to Mary. Mary, who grew up rich. And it's very interesting to see how she supports him. He gets the human connection. He's a very smart man. Probably not as smart as Philip. Probably not anywhere near as smart as Philip. But still very an intelligent a very intelligent man. And he uh, but he gets that human connection and he sees that and he and he's so gifted and talented and everything. And Mary drops her rich, well-to-do life and the prospect of a rich husband and all that in favor of Rampion and the way he lives in hopes that he will become successful and they will end up just living rich and loaded anyway. He never drops that, even in success, he never drops the way he was brought up. And there's a very interesting way he puts it. He never drops it because his mother had to live her entire life poor. And he says to live rich and easy would be a disrespect to the way that she lived. And that's just such an, like, honestly, it's, it's, it's a dumb kind of honoristic kind of code because it's like, well, you're not your mom. You've made it. It's okay for you to do this. But to still, to think like that, you know, and he still does live rich. He's not, like this isn't keeping him from living rich and having maids and servants and money and a, a generally easy physical life. You know, he's not having to labor, he's not having to toil. Um, but it still hurts him sometimes. And it's like, that's such a callback to the mom and everything. And it's such a, such a, he's so parent focused because he never knew his dad. And his mom raised him and did everything she could and always felt bad that she couldn't do more for him even though i mean she didn't have to he he found his way and he found his way with mary and mary's support and mary's financial support that they that she gave to him to start out until he got successful by the way which she did um while he had no scrap of success whatsoever had not even actually tried writing anything just knew he wanted to and she just okay you want to you want to bad enough obviously you're going to so let's just do it just do it i'll set you up for a couple years we'll get enough money then we'll be shown by my father and we'll get married and you'll be successful and that'll be that and he's so he gets so stressed out um because of wanting to succeed for her and to keep to keep her you know happy and make sure that she's okay and it's just ah uh, ah uh, He's, it's there's such a there's such a worry for money from Rampion, even in his um even in his uh, success and all that there's there's still a worry for money in the financial side of things because he grew up so poor and it's so so weird because of um how it seems like the people who worry about money in this book are the people who usually don't have it or didn't have it at some point there's another character um whose name who's known as illage and he is um assistant to 
Lord Edward Tantamount, who has become a scientist and knowledge is a very brilliant, very smart man in science, very young man though, and he still needs a mentor, and this mentor turns out to be Tantamount. But in being that, you know, he, he's not paid anything extravagant, but he is around the rich society a lot. He um, is very, very close to them. He's, uh, he's actually friends with Walter because Walter feels so alienated from everybody. He hasn't taken his father's success, um, partly because I believe his, pro his father probably hasn't allowed him. And it's not really specific, but we do know Walter is hard up on money. And that's, again, part of the reason for why Marjorie and him have such problems together because she's jealous of this Lucy woman that he has seen because she's rich and all this. But it, it seems like the ones who have the issues with the money in the book are the ones who don't have it. And that's such a, I mean, that's such a obvious thing that even comes to now, you know, is people can, people who have money, you see, spend it and they don't think about it. But then people who don't, I mean, obviously they have they have to worry about it. It's forced upon them, and Huxley talks about how it's forced upon um, them to care about money because they they just don't have it, and it's the only way that they can survive. You know, and then the rich people have gone past the point of survival, and they're now living, and it's or they're living as so-called living. You know, it's not called that in the book or anything, but it is, it, it, it's, it's, they've gotten past the whole survival day-to-day -day business routine. But it's still, one thing that's also so found out is Illage and his misery of being poor is still very successful besides, and he's very happy in his work and he's very, you know, enjoys it quite a bit. Same with Rampio. He, he. He didn't have it before, but he's very happy with what he has now, but also with his work and how he hard he worked to get to that point. And then his mother was very happy being poor because she was just trying to, to break it through. And every single person who comes from wealth and lost it or comes from wealth and is still in it is absolutely miserable. Absolutely miserable. Except for Lucy and Lady Tantamount who know that they've arrived and they've gotten where they need to be and they, now they can just have fun, basically, is what it is. But then you end up hating those characters because of it. And it's just... Oh, there's a lot of setup. Sorry for the pen. There's a lot of setup. And I'm really excited where to see where it goes. I am almost done with the second 100 pages and there's a lot of development with Walter. Um, I didn't even talk about Spandrel being introduced, Walter's boss. Um, there's just a lot of setup and I think there's going to be a lot of payoff for this whole book and the rest of the way it goes. This was just an introductory, this was just to feel these characters, see how they are next to each other. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the first hundred pages. It's, it's very interesting so far. Again, don't have as much notes, it's going to be shorter, even though this video is, ooh, it's going to be long anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, if anybody's out there watching it, cool. You love books that's awesome i didn't think this was a book that many people had read or that many people were ever going to read but i still think it's very interesting i do want to share i do like to get my ideas out there ideas ideas out there and um it helps me understand the book better it helps me get more into the book and it helps me get motivated to read it more because i love to read even as hard as it is to actually get myself to read i, I do love to do it so much so much and I finally, um, I've been trying to record on different things. I finally got, uh, this is just a phone, but it, it, I think it'll work. Uh, hopefully I can get it edited down, compress, do all that, start to learn about video editing jargon. Very messy video, I know. Uh, again, this is for anybody who's actually watching, I don't expect anybody to, but very messy first video. Uh, but I had fun. That's it. All, that's all I'm looking for is just a little bit of fun I'm in college so I'm, I'm miserable a lot edit that out yeah anyway yeah it's good talk good discussion um if there's anybody reading or if there's anybody watching and has read or is currently reading or just knows something about the book um try not to give spoilers away but 
if I am incorrect in anything that I say, uh, if you don't care to explain how I'm incorrect or like a pronunciation or anything, um, try to correct me in the comments or anything, and um, I'll I'll start the next video with the corrections to the previous video. Hopefully, this will be four parter, and then. Um, if there's enough corrections that need to be made, I will just make a completely separate video for it, because I, you know, obviously this is, yeah. This is just me rambling on about the first impressions of a book. Again, I didn't even take notes for the first hundred pages, just started taking notes. You know, every one of those post notes was a note. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, if you actually listened to it, thanks for listening, thanks for watching. Uh, see ya!